Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com. You can find cool stuff in stock every day and check out our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. And check out our altar sleeves. Support the show by using the code MAGICMIKES at checkout for 5% off anything in the store. I am Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, MTG Nerd Girl. Hey, guys. Ruben Bressler. Good afternoon. How are things? Well, it's time to talk about a brand new magic set. We got them. That's right. We're not going to have another one for like three months or something. So we got to dig in. We got to enjoy the wedding that is the Crimson Bow, as it were. But first, we have to begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who is the most eloquent, letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top 10 blue cards on Arena. Ruben? Well, uh, Sig is the winner this week. Uh, either the River Cutthroat or the River Guide. I'm not sure which, but YouTube commenter Sig had a very excellent take, which I enjoyed. Everyone needs to find a magic card that looks at you like Evan looks at Diet Cherry Pepsi after a long, delicious sip during a top 10. That card for me is Emery, Lurker of the Lock. Strange merfolk lying in ponds distributing artifacts is no basis for Ruben to choose the honorable mention, but the ability to get back all of my Paradox Engines, Swords, and Mana Rocks after my opponents deal with them is too good to resist in my book. Yeah. All right. This person's Holy Grail reference just got so many brownie points. Mm Mm-hmm. I got the brownie points on that one. Uh, Emery Lurker of the Lock originally showed up in Throne of Eldraine. It's a blue and two generic mana for a one, two rare legendary Merfolk wizard. This spell costs one generic mana less to cast for each artifact you control. When Emery Lurker of the Lock enters the battlefield, you put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. Uh, you mill four cards and tap, ch- tap colon, choose target artifact card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. So it's a Throne of Eldraine card, which means it's generally going to be power through the roof. Uh, it's worded in the just the right way to get around the commander tax if they kill your guy two or three times. And it's crazy powerful, which is also a Throne of Eldraine staple, now, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, yep. this thing is a uh, competitive brawl staple. Um, lots of things, uh, lots of artifacts like to go to the graveyard. You mm-hmm. know, your your Icker Well Springs and your uh, uh, Mind Stones and what have you. Mm-hmm. Much less if you mill something gigantic like an Immortal Sun or a Paradox Engine into your graveyard as well. Absolutely. So we do appreciate Sig being a part of the show. Please contact us on social media for your prize. Thanks again for cool to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring this giveaway. Stay tuned for our top 10 list this week, and maybe, maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate. Because it's time to talk about Crimson Vow. You guys super excited about the new set? Um, I wouldn't say super excited. I would say I am uh, cautiously optimistic about the new set. I think that particularly the aggro decks get some interesting tools. Mm. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that tribal synergies are going to finally be able to break through. There's some very powerful tribal stuff in this set. Mm. Um, I am hoping that something and or at least multiple things can at least uh, try to dethrone some of the things that have been on top of the mountain for a very long time. Yeah, it's got a a lot of stuff. I mean, as far as limited goes, I mean, I was kind of bored with uh, Midnight Hunt like two days in. So I'm definitely excited to try something new. I hope the colors are a bit more balanced so that way we can actually get some more replayability in the set because this is a longer set, which... I typically prefer the two month cycle, I think is a little too fast, um, at, at least from a having to do set review articles perspective. <laughs> but yeah, I think hopefully this is going to be a, a lot more fun. Yeah, as for a limited environment for, for Midnight Hunt, I guess looking back, like that's one of those things where, like after I think it was, I think it was like eight or nine days when I started opening packs and getting gems instead of, you know, rares or whatever, which is generally my like, you know, my, I'm probably going to cut it off unless I really enjoy it. And I, I haven't really played it ever since. I haven't really played any drafts. I've not been wanting to go spend any money on it or really real mm-hmm. time on it because it's nice, but it's... It's fine. I, I will say fine. I got really bored of best of one, but best of three yep. stayed kind of interesting. Hmm. Um, the, a lot of cards picked up in sideboarded games. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, I had been just playing best of ones to just grind out these draft queues and it wasn't going to the traditional. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, but that format in particular really felt like it needed three games to be able to figure out what was happening. Well, let's see how interesting. I, Go ahead. 
I was going to say, I, I said something very similar a few weeks ago. This was the first set where I actively have been streaming best of three. I typically avoid them. Viewership for it's lower. They like to see those ranks. Mm -hmm. But I was not having any fun. And we are seeing a lot more deck diversity in best of three. And that, I think, really helped keep it fresh. It's amazing. It, just, it cracks me up every single time. You play best of three and you're like, whoa, this hand is terrible. Because you, you don't get terrible hands in best of one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They might not be great. They might just be okay. Mm -hmm. But you don't get terrible hands in best of one. You get terrible hands in best of three. Anyway, Nerd Girl, tell us, what is your number 10? So my number 10 is, I don't think it's going to, to be any good and constructed. But I like what it does for casual play, for EDH, and I like it in limited. So I thought I would give it that honorary 10 spot. Mm -hmm. And that's Anja, Maid of Dishonor. It is two colorless black red for a legendary vampire when Anja made of dishonor and or uh, one or more vampires enter the battlefield under your control, create a blood token. Uh, and you can pay two, sacrifice another creature or a blood token. Each opponent loses two life, you gain two life. And it is a four five for four mana, which is amazingly above rate for limited. It gives you a ton of extra reach with your, you know, your blood tokens as well as uh, is a really easy way to continue to make more blood tokens for just by playing your vampires. You just get this nice bonus, which will oftentimes enable their abilities, let you get rid of your land. It does a ton of stuff. So I think this will see some play. It also works really well with uh, Olivia. It's one of the, uh, I believe, one of only six other legendary vampires that will work with Olivia. Hmm. In the standard environment, sure. Yep. Yeah, this is a card where like on rate, it's very nice. And when the it and or another vampire, you're getting value. The blood token thing, don't get me started. But for two generic mana, you're sacking creatures of tokens and able to, you know, essentially end the game and put you mm -hmm. in a situation where you are able to end the game using that trigger. I think that's great. This is both super cool to build around, I think, and also fun, maybe in constructed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it closes out games pretty darn quick in any format that it's in. And it got Siege Rhino stats, so how bad can it be? There you go. <laughs> Ruben, what's number 10? Uh, my number 10, uh, I kind of like that it's at number 10 because we got to talk about Emery as the honorable mention, mm -hmm. uh, making things cost less and having cool interactions with artifacts. Uh, and then we talked about Angie at number 10 uh, for uh, Nerd Girls list. And... Both of those cards would very much so benefit from this card. Uh, I actually think that this is going to be... I actually think that this common is going to be better in Constructed than it is in Limited. It might be fine in Limited, but um, I made a tweet when this set was in the process of being previewed that I'm looking forward to the creature that costs one mana that makes a blood token. And we got one. Uh, Voldaren Epicure is a red mana for a 1-1 one, one common vampire. When Voldaren Epicure enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to each opponent, create a blood token. That's really good. I mean, anytime there is a one mana card that makes two permanents, you have to sit up and take notice. This makes a creature... This has an enters the battlefield trigger that can help with spectacle, that can help with other abilities, and it makes an artifact, which, as we've seen, it doesn't matter what the artifact does, really. Um, if it makes an artifact, it's going to be playable. So I think that Voldaren Epicure is, has a good chance. Hmm. Yeah, I think that this is, I mean, I had a very similar argument talking about it in the limited uh, format. And one other thing that you... Uh, didn't know to like mention that it does trigger is all, all the vampire uh, mechanics from the previous set where yeah. if they have lost life, do the thing, mm -hmm. whether that's add a counter, drain, whatever. But there is a lot of lost life, you know, post combat main phase type abilities that we want. And this will uh, activate that and maybe give uh, red aggro a, a shot. Hmm. Now, I mean, it's not quite Thraben Inspector, don't get me wrong, but. It is one mana. It does cool stuff. Yeah. Interacts in the right way. Very neat. It's a fe it's essentially a raging goblin that lets you loot later, and it's two permanents. Like I think it actually. I mean, I think it's got a good shot. I mean, rummage, yeah. right? But it's all good. Look, sure. Well, so this card that I wanted to talk about for my number ten. Now, there's there's some options that the options that I could have had, and I could have talked about other stuff, but I did not because I wanted to point out this card in particular. I like 
I like limiting cards particularly now because what Wizards does, Wizards is thinking and talking about multiplayer formats, casual formats, what's going to happen at the commander table. And so now, as someone who likes to play in a constructed environment, you're not the odd person out, but you're the one who they're not necessarily designing things for. So when I find something I said, hey, this looks like it was designed for a multiplayer environment, but in 1v1, it's going to be really super sweet. I see a card like Blood Vile Purveyor, and I go, that's a four mana, five, six six trample with flying so a flample five six for four mana you have my attention and you sit there and you read it and you go really is it really that bad of a drawback let's talk about it so for two black and two generic mana it's a five six rare vampire so it's already a vampire we're already talking about being vampires being great whenever an opponent casts a spell that player creates a blood token which means an artifact with one tap sack. You can discard a card to draw a card, uh, which is fine. And whenever it attacks, it gets plus one plus zero for each blood token defending player controls. So they have to play the spells to get the tokens. They have to use the tokens to get rid of them. Otherwise this damn thing becomes a six, six flying trample by default if they play one spell on their turn. Sign me up, man. Let's go. Turn three with land or elves. Let's, let's go. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. This thing's dope. I didn't realize this thing was this big, but this is Abyssal Persecutor stats. Yeah. Uh, this is Desecration Demon stats, and that drawback is not nearly as bad as either of those cards. Yeah, that drawback doesn't go like, wow, this sucks now. I'm just like, wait, this drawback makes it stronger? Like okay like i'm okay with all of those things happening and that's why i like that card all right yeah this is gonna be a bomb in limited too this is uh, oh, yeah. very few actually i think that when i was going through the set there's very few like 4.5 and 5s that are just going to instantly end games this one you know answer it now or scoop them up i mean yeah it's like you i guess it gives you ways to go find answers maybe kind of but yeah in the middle of it it's a five six flying train right. it's gonna be the, the death of course its downside is that hashtag dies to doom blade and also when you doom blade it you get a blood token like i get that but you also know? it's so big <laughs> it's so big that and evasive and trample like yeah. flample yeah. is insane it, yeah this thing will end games extremely quickly i mean think about this really it's, it's a little silly right but you think of it you if you play a second one and they play literally anything they've given you seven six flying tramplers like what the hell is happening i think this card is awesome and i'm very excited about it let's go on here to number nine ruben what you got uh, my number nine uh, is very similar to my number 10, um, but I actually think might have uh, additional implications for older formats, and that is Blood Fountain. Ooh. Blood Fountain is a black mana artifact that when it enters the battlefield, you make a blood token. And three colorless and a black tap and sacrifice it, return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. Again, everything I said about my number 10 goes up for my number nine it's two permanents this time though those all tap with urza lord high artificer they make emery cost less like artifacts are way more busted in older formats with the ability to interact with them hmm. uh than than like a one one creature that deals a damage so blood fountain it's one to keep an eye on i i mean it's it's something that i'm not exactly sure what it's what's gonna what it's gonna do but one mana make two artifacts i don't care care what the artifacts are uh this has some potential okay I that mean, is that is not one that i that really piqued my interest but again like that's i think for more um either historic or or modern type things so, so a little out of my area of expertise but it does sound very interesting and, and part of me feels like you know blood tokens uh, they probably, I can imagine they play very well. That's that's the first thing. A, they wouldn't have think made it as far as they did if they didn't really work well with the set. And when you think things like the blood tokens are getting you to your lands that you need and your answers that you need and you're discarding your creatures, this gets you back the creatures that you discarded using the blood token that it mm -hmm. gave you, yep. which is very cool and synergistic in that way, which I think is really nice. Um, Nerd Girl, what's number nine? Uh, my number nine is one of my hires. I have three of them. Ooh, well, I got two, so I'm right there with you but uh for my number nine i think this card is amazing i think this card could reach older formats i think the idea of having the idea of a new mechanic on a very low cost important creature type well 
creature is huge. And so I didn't think too much of it sort of at first, but man, it didn't take too long to figure out any sort of scenarios where Hopeful Initiate is amazing in the humans deck. It's one white mana for a rare human warlock that is a one, two with training, which means whenever this creature attacks with another creature with greater power, you put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. And of course it has an awesome ability of a white and two generic mana. Remove two plus one, plus one counters from among creatures you control. That doesn't mean it, that means any of them. Thanks, yeah. you know, Thalia's Lieutenant and everybody. Remove two plus one plus one creatures from among creatures you control, destroy target artifact or enchantment. This thing comes with disenchants. This thing gets bigger over time. This thing works perfectly with what the human's deck's been doing anyway. It's a one drop that's absolutely fantastic next to hero or uh, next to, um, uh, what's the one drop they use? The, um, uh, the hero champion champion thank you. champion of the parish that I absolutely this is like would be my eight one drops right there hanging out because hopeful initiate like it just grows it gets scary and it kills any of their artifacts and champions that are messing you up like when i when i saw that word among creatures i'm like okay all right this thing is juiced this card is fantastic no, I, yeah. I agree. I think this is good for limited. Uh, I also, I think this card would be good if it didn't have training itself, if it was just mm -hmm. other creatures. But the yeah. fact that it enables itself and others, um, I mean, this is going to be very helpful for things like Chariot or Ranger's Glass. Like this is, I, I really like this card a lot. I was pretty uh, hyped about it during my set review as well. Nice. Yeah, this card seems super dope, and for the humans to get a really awesome one drop, and not just that, a really awesome one drop on in historic. You know, there is no champion of the parish in historic. You don't have that awesome one drop in humans. They need an awesome one drop in humans. That's another part of this card that makes this awesome. All right, we want here to our number eight, which is my first hire, which sucks, but whatever. Ruben, what's your number eight? Uh, my number eight is a card that is similar to cards we've seen in the past, and typically they are playable. Um, I believe Zathrid Necromancer comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, there was a similar card, I think it was like Rotlung Reanimator was one of the originals that kind of did this, which is when something dies, you make a 2-2. Um, and this one slots perfectly into one of the most aggressive strategies, and it might make a tribal deck playable, and that is Headless Rider. Mm. Headless Rider is two colorless, or two generic, and a black for a 3-1 zombie. And when Headless Rider or another non-token zombie you control dies, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Look, man, people play Wraths. People play Pyroclasms. People play Removal. And if you're a tribal deck, that's not great. But if you're a tribal deck and you play a Headless Rider, you go one drop creature, two drop creature, Headless Rider, and they wrath you, guess what? You still have three creatures. Yeah. Uh, also, three power for three mana. Uh, three one stats are, are powerful, especially in these aggressively slanted tribal decks. And you don't really care if this trades down because you're not really trading down because it leaves something behind. Yeah. Uh, I think another important implication as, as far as the limited side of this is that this is going to enable all your exploit cards. Mm. Um, now, you can't exploit the token that it makes, but you can keep using your actual cardboard creatures, uh, non-token creatures, as exploit fodder without actually getting any huge downside. You're like, okay, you know, even if your creature's slightly better, it's a 3-3, whatever the case may be, it's getting replaced because of this mechanics, which just allows you to run infinite exploits with, you know, very little downside. Yeah, this looks perfect for the historic zombies deck, whether it's in the sideboard for the wrath heavy decks, or maybe it's good enough for main because there's just so much value you're able to get out of it. Um, like this thing's already pre-ordered for like eight or nine bucks for a reason. And sure. yeah, people like their zombies. This is a very powerful zombie. And if you think of this being the upgrade to headless horseman from legends, which is yeah. a three mana two two literal same cost black two generic mana for a two two that's it we we got to glow up everybody very nice nerd girl what's your number eight or what's your number eight rather my number eight is my second hire oh got him in a row all right well ruben saved us on that one let's move on here to our number seven nerd girl what's your number seven so my number seven is a card that I don't know if it's going to see a ton of play. It's a little bit overpriced, but it seems really interesting to me. Um, now this is, it's a overcharged amalgam Ooh. for two colorless blue blue. We get a three, three flying zombie whore with exploit. And when it exploits, uh, it can, uh, 
counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. Now we've seen, uh, you know, a spell, uh, an actual counter spell recently that did this, where we could counter the triggered or and or activated abilities, but it seemed a little too corner case, and it wasn't super exciting. Now getting to put some sort of counter spell onto what could potentially be a win condition is pretty interesting. Uh, so you still get to use those counters, possibly, uh, you know, get use out of those weaker zombie tokens that we've created. And I think it's going to be pretty good and limited. Um, even if you decide to just flash this thing in and end turn and, uh, and then start beating with it, we were playing the three mana flying f three, three flasher for five last yeah. set. And I mean, it wasn't anything we were excited about, but this is just better than that. And if, uh, if we need to exploit in a pinch, it's nice to have access to. Yeah, this yeah. card is absolutely terrific. This was uh, my number eight, um, like right behind your number seven, because I yep. think this card is dope. This thing slices and dices. It works amazingly with the decayed tokens. Like that is just going to synergize. Like black, blue zombies is just going to like come together. With all the ability to make those tokens off all those triggers. And this doesn't just counter a spell. It's not just Mystic Snake. It's yeah. stifle. It's stifle and Mystic Snake. It's it's mm -hmm. right there. It's all the things you want it to be. You stop the Planeswalker Ultimates when they think you have you. You stop the triggers from lands. You stop the triggers from different abilities that trigger on things like the, the Smoldering Egg and stuff like that. Just weird little corner case stuff that you're going to wreck your opponent with because you're able to stop anything, not just spells. That's This thing is nuts. I think this thing is incredible. Yeah, I, I may have had it too low. And not only is it, uh, well, I don't have it on my list at all. So, you know, if you have it too low, what's my problem? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if uh, uh, it would have been, you know, Mystic Snake, if it was a 2-2, but it's a 3-3. Three, three. Oh, and not God. only is it a 3-3, three, three, it's a flyer yeah. in a deck that rarely, I mean, it's blue, so you can put it in any deck. But the zombie exploit stuff, those decks rarely have evasive phantom monsters. Like, this thing is an enormous clock all by itself, and oh, by the way, disruption. So, yeah, this card's uh, very, very good. So, what's wrong with your list, bro? Like, why don't. Well, I've got other problem. cards that I wanted to talk about. So. Oh, nice. I, he's always missing one or two cards because he gives those weird, like, number cutesy bonuses that yeah. that, that are not actually right. relevant cards. This is yep. my number so. seven because there's three power and four toughness guys. Yep. Baba yep. Baba yep. 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 <laughs> Math gotcha. jokes. Math jokes. <laughs> Ruben, That's right. What's your number seven? My number seven is a seven, seven for seven. No, my number seven <laughs> is another card that gives hope to a tribal deck uh, that I'm hoping can help make that tribal deck playable and standard. It is a just just an enormous beater uh, for the cost, and it's somewhat difficult to get rid of. Uh, my number seven is Hamlet Vanguard. Hamlet Vanguard is two generic and a green for a 1-1 one, one human warrior with Ward 2, which means when it becomes the target of a spell or an ability an opponent controls, counter it unless that player pays 2. And Hamlet Vanguard enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it for each other non-token human you control. So you play a human deck. You go turn one human, turn two human, turn three. You have a 5-5 five, five for three mana with Ward 2. That's or, real good. Ooh, for each. I didn't think I didn't really catch the for each on it now, did I? Yeah. Ooh, that's a lot five of five is a I mean, that's Love Struck Beast stats right there, my friends. I mean, I know yeah. that it still gets swept up in the wraths. I know that it's you know, it's dependent on the board state, but it's fine later too, right? Like, you know, you play this one on turn three, and then the next one you play is even bigger. So it's I think this has a chance, and this has a chance to be a centerpiece of that aggressive kind of green-white human stuff. Nice. Yeah, the one of the things that we have to like talk about is in the mono green deck, at least in standard, there's a lot of three drops to compete with right now. Right. Um, and I think that would be the only reason it wouldn't stand a chance, not because it by itself is not good enough. It's just, it's a kind of a clunky spot already, and we've had so many good playable green cards. Um Tiny little side note, during my set review, I have a, I, this picture when it came up and it was altered to have Hamlet's picture, my dog, <gasps> inside. Aww, it was so cute. Perfect. Oh, that's nice. This, this to me, look, the fact that they gave you that one mana rare human that I just talked about, that, mm -hmm. that card's fantastic. The fact that you have that green white human in uh, uh, Midnight Hunt, the one that taps humans to add mana, that yes. card mm -hmm. is fantastic. This Catilda. on your three, Catilda, 
this on your three drop, like Sagarda on your four drop. Like I think there's a curve there and I've played the green white humans deck and it's cool, but it could definitely use some firepower like this to help it against those mono green decks that just, well, they have a lot yeah. of beaters and death. Yeah. I mean, the green white humans deck never really has a chance in standard right now for a couple of reasons. Mm-hmm. But one of them is that the mono green deck is just bigger, right? right? It's like when you're playing the Doran deck against Zoo in Extended 15 years ago. Your Kurt Apes are just smaller than their Dorans, and your humans are just smaller than their three fours for three, right? right. So this, though, this is bigger. This goes bigger, not just wider, which is a problem that the humans deck have sometimes. I think the way to think about it is that this on curve, one hum, turn one human, turn two human, turn three this, is bigger, correct me if I'm wrong, than any other three drop that the green deck could play. It's bigger than the three mana troll that's a four four. Uh, it's bigger than the three mana thing that comes with a clue that's a four three. Um, I'm pretty sure it stops yeah. everything. So that's important. And, that, and much less if you go turn two, two one drops, mm-hmm. then this is a seven seven. So, yet again, here for my number seven, we're back in a world where it feels like, it feels like, that this was a multiplayer card. But turns out, and maybe it's not, but it turns out this seems to be absolutely incredible, not just on curve, on rate, on the ability for red to get card advantage. Have you seen Curse of Hospitality? Do you understand what that card's doing? Because it's scary, y'all. For red and two generic mana, it is enchantment or a curse. It's a rare. It enchants a player. Creatures attacking the enchanted player have trample, so that means all your guys. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to the enchanted player, that player exiles the top card of the library until end of turn, that creature's controller may play that card and they may spend mana as the mana of any color to cast that spell. So you get their lands, you get their spells, you play one drop, two drop this, you're getting card advantage, they, all your creatures have trample, so your pump spells are amazing. They have to stop your stuff or you're going to just roll them over, not just with your stuff, but with their stuff and that just get, makes me all sorts of excited yeah it's kind of an interesting mechanic because um you know if it has a controlly vibe to it because you're mm. getting those cards off your opponent's deck you're getting card advantage but also you're really incentivized to kind of go a bit wider mm. uh and also maybe utilize the trample i think this is a really fun card i'm definitely excited for it in limited i'm not sure what deck is going to be able to take advantage of this in the current standard but we're going to definitely see how these red cards in this format like shake things up too yeah uh, I also really love the flavor of this, the Curse mm. of Hospitality, playing off of the, you know, you need permission for to enter a house if you're a vampire. I think that that's really cool flavor. Mm. Uh, the card advantage is super unique. Um, the adding trample is really interesting. Um, I think that this is potentially a sideboard card for those red aggressive decks uh, against control decks in particular uh, to be able to just, you know, sort of take all of your opponent's stuff. This, to me, reads like a card that had all of the text whenever a creature does combat damage, blah, 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 but didn't have that trample thing on there. And they play with it, and they're like, they could just chump block all day. And we're like, all right, all right, we'll just give them trample. Add trample to the file and move on. It's fine, it's fine. Moving here to number six. Ruben, what's number six? Number six is a card that uh, we talked a little about on the live show, and I don't think Evan was particularly impressed by it. Um, but I, I'm pretty impressed by it. I think that it has a chance to be very, very, very good. Um, because it just is power. It just is numbers and it's a good rate. You don't necessarily need it to, you know, to do something else. You just need it to draw three cards. And that is inspiring or inspired idea. Inspired Idea is two generic and a blue for a sorcery. It also has cleave of three generic blue blue, which means that you can cast this spell for its cleave cost. If you do, remove the words in square brackets. Draw three cards. Your maximum hand size is reduced by three for the rest of the game. So if you pay three mana, you draw three cards, and then your max hand size is four. If you cleave it, you just draw three cards. Um, I think that the... Cleave cost is too much. Three cards at sorcery speed is not good. Um, I think that draw three cards, your max hand size is reduced. That's a fa- I'm, I would trade. I would make that trade in 
almost every deck. Um, I think that uh, there's there's a lot of reasons to want to have your max hand size reduced, especially early in the game in decks mm-hmm. that want inspired idea. Uh, lots of phoenixes like being into graveyards, for example. Um, three mana, draw three cards. If the rest of the card does it doesn't have a ridiculous drawback, it sees play, and I think inspired idea is going to see play. Hmm. I. I, I actually rated this very highly for the limited format because I'm thinking, okay, we can't divination on three to, to hit our land drops, but it gives us an extra card. And by the time I'm casting this to refill my hand, I don't care if my hand size is down to four. I agree that this is possibly going to see some play in historic. Uh, I can I definitely get your point about the phoenixes and stuff, but this is absolutely not what I want my standard to be doing uh, in any blue deck right now. All of my blue decks, they want... Uh, you know, 14 foretold cards and seven cards in hand at all times. Uh, I, I can't see this being standard relevant. I mean, this was a card that it's Jace's ingenuity at sorcery speed at for its cleave cost. That's that's obviously bad. Duh. But, you know, and the other half of it being great for reanimator decks was, you know, like this was like on first blush. I was like, this card is terrible. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Obviously, reanimator decks like to discard stuff. This helps you not only draw the cards to discard, but to help you keep the, the hand size low so you can, which is fine. Um, this is, again, this is one of those where I think, you know, when Ruben says the words, like if, if it's three mana, draw three. And you're not losing anything, you know, incredibly important. You're not losing lands. You know what I mean? You're not losing cards in your deck or whatever. You're not having to get rid of stuff. You're not having to let your opponent make any choices. You know what I mean? Like, this is all of your choice if you want to do it. And if you're trying to get stuff in the yard, this seems like an easy way to do that when you're looking at two gristle brands or whatever in hand when you're legacy. Three mana draw three cards is three mana draw three cards. And that's pretty powerful magic. Nurgirl, what's number six? My number six is my last of three hires. Ooh, so many hires. Okay, well, that's cool. My number five is a hire. Spoiler alert, but we got to go through my number six first because it's dope and I like it. Uh, this is a card that Ari Lax jumped on as one of the best cards in the set. It's already four or five plus dollars, depending on the version you're looking at. Uh, I think this card is super cool. This card's cool in a whole bunch of different ways. Not only is it cool in that it really helps sort of a control deck get you know a, a tighter grasp on the game, um, but it also gives you something to do on your early turns for a control deck, which you don't always get to do. Uh, my number six is Concealing Curtains. Concealing Curtains is one black mana for a rare creature wall. Hey, Rubes. Uh, nice. It is a, it has Defender, of course. It's an 0-4, but for a black and two generic mana, you transform it. And, of course, you can activate that only as a sorcery. But you flip it over into Revealing Eye. That's a 3-4 menace. And when this creature transforms into Revealing Eye, eye target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If you do, that player discards that card, then draws a card. And, again, this is... The idea that you're taking their best card. You're 100% taking the best card in their hand every time. That's guaranteed. The other half of it, you're going to have a 3-4. They might kill it while that trigger's in the stack or whatever, but you're going to flip that thing over because you've already paid the cost and the way it goes. And so when you get that trigger on the stack, you're taking the best thing they got, and 40% of the time you're replacing it with a blank land, with just a land. And if anything else you're replacing it with, ideally, is going to be worse than what you just took. And so that ability to have an early threat that comes down and stops early aggression while being able to see their hand and all the information you can do when you know what's in their hand, uh, this card seems fantastic. Yeah, um, this was actually my number nine. It was my first hire. Uh, This is a a black one drop, which I think black is really struggling to have any relevant one drops in the format. It does something light. It becomes a threat. Um, Like you were saying that, you know, the thing that you're getting rid of at that point on turn three is, is, you know, usually going to redraw something much worse because there's a lot of good cards to take uh, and what is best for them, you know, really depends on your hand. And even if all of that, you know, even if they redraw the same card, you're still getting a ton of knowledge, which allows you to play your hand appropriately. And I think that that's really good. I think this might be a hope for black to get into standard. Yeah. This card reminds me of Knight of the Ebon Legion, actually, which is the classic aggro vampire that got good when you put three mana into it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, except for the problem was that Knight of the Ebon Legion kind of got shocked a lot, right? Mm-hmm. 
you play an O4 that turns into a 3-4, that thing's not going to die very easy. So you got your defense early. Uh, this is a good card in aggro decks in aggro mirrors, mm-hmm. right? So it's got menace, so it's evasive. It takes their best thing. It's got that thought not seer kind of ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this card is absolutely spectacular. And again, the flavor of the evil eye that you cover up with the curtains uh, is is really clever. Nice. Yeah, the the I I mean I think for right now Black has they have eye twitch and they have shambling gas which are both fine one drops in their own way but again it, it doesn't feel like the right sort of role that this would feel in a way that it's both it's scary it's good in blocking and it's good at being a threat later um, I think it's gonna be a fantastic cyborg card against the control mirrors for example uh, yeah this card is super dope yeah eye twitch and shambling gas are. Uh, uh, archetype specific I -hmm. feel and this is just good by itself I like that going here to our number five again that's higher on someone else's list for me but Ruben what's your number five my number five I've already talked about the virtues of my number five and we've already talked about what happens when they spoil a two mana creature that's a mythic Mm. my number five is cemetery gatekeeper Mm mm-hmm colorless and a red two one first striking vampire when it enters the enters the battlefield exile a card from a graveyard whenever a player plays a land or casts a spell if it shares a card type with the exiled card cemetery gatekeeper deals two damage to that player that's insane like let's like it it also is a it's a signal post to me i don't know if this is just me looking past something but they didn't give it a second creature type they didn't give it noble Right. They didn't give it soldier. They didn't want to give it something extra just in case they were like, it's already good enough. We don't want to give it a job title, even though it's a gatekeeper. Um, To me, that that says to me, they're like, we know this card is good. Yeah, I think this card is really interesting. And we had a, uh, you know, I think a pretty relevant mythic two drop in the last set. Uh, And I'm hoping that these two things together might give red a fighting chance. You know, the interaction that for me went like from zero to, oh my God, this thing is unbelievable, um, is you go turn to fetch land and you exile the fetch land. uh, And whenever a player plays a land or casts a spell, it deals two damage. So you, you exile a land and from then on you have a two mana Zozu. Like, yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, that's how that works. And so if they use a fetch land, first of all, Zozu is going to damage them for four. And secondly, you play your second cemetery game where you take another land. And then, like, how many lands can they actually start playing when you have these two one stupid first strikers that's actually going to kill them? And, like, this card is 30 bucks for a reason. I hope it works out in standard, honestly, because it's so powerful in older formats just because fetch lands exist. Yeah. Like, just modern. Yeah. It's going to be insane at burn. Insane. Even in a limited format, you know, I mean, I think it's going to be very good and constructed, but in a limited format, if you're in the aggressive seat, if this, you know, pings them for two to four before they manage to deal with it, that's a pretty good spot for red to be in. That's a lot of extra reach to help you close out those games. And I do think that that's going to have a lot of uh, interest in standard because we haven't seen red been able to get into the game since you know, post rotation. So I think getting to shock some of those control decks for four to six damage uh, before they can manage to stabilize might just be enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, against the, the red decks, you take a sorcery or an instant and like every card you play is going to damage you for two. You play two of them, things yeah. start stacking. Suddenly when you play a land or a spell or an instant, you start getting damaged for two. That stuff doesn't take long to kill somebody. Right. A lot of the time it's like, well, I got them to four, but then they just played three Alruin's Epiphanies in a row after they burned down the house. If they don't get the opportunity to do that because they're just taking this chip damage every turn until they manage to deal with your two mana two one, Mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Very nice. Nerd Girl, what's number five? My number five is a pretty interesting card. I've seen um, a little bit of hype around. It seems... A little expensive, but I don't know if that's going to matter in the world of like Epiphany. And I think it'll see some some play in Historic, and that is the Hullbreaker Horror. This is a seven mana, five colorless, blue, blue, for a Kraken Horror that's a seven, eight with Flash. Uh, It says this spell can't be countered, pretty stinking relevant uh, in the control mirrors. And then whenever you cast a spell, choose one of one of these. Uh, return target spell you can uh, you don't control to its owner's hand or return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand so this is basically just turning all of your spells into counters and bounces which basically lets you do double counters and bounces um, 
So now we're gonna, you know, end of turn cast this. It cannot be countered. Um, there's very little instant speed removal that some of the control decks are gonna be able to use. And from here on out, we're going to be able to just untap, hold open our, um, you know, bounce spells. And then they're like, okay, I'm gonna try to cast this one thing. And I'm like, okay, bounce your other thing, counter this, you know. So all of our spells are gonna be pulling double duty. And mm -hmm. the fact that this can be flashed in end of turn can't be countered means that they're not gonna be able to deal with it. And if you untap, now what? Every, okay, I'm gonna draw four cards in response to your spell and counter it. Now what are you gonna do? <laughs> like it's like the greatest green blue ramp thing I've ever yeah. seen. It's <sighs> unbelievable. Yeah. Oh well yeah. God. Now all of your growth spirals and explorers also bounce things. Like mm -hmm. that's a that's pretty insane. Uh notably this card plays well with Lear which says that spells can't be countered mm -hmm. and you're not countering spells with Hullbreaker Horror. Nope. Um, uh, seven, eight is going to close out games super quick and it's going to be the biggest, baddest mother on the board. This is a great control finisher. Uh, I love this thing. Uh, it, very close to coming to my list because I think that this is going to see a lot of play. I mean, it's $13 right now. Extended art 20, extended art foil 30. Like, People already, already love this card. It's there. People enjoy it, and it's great. So high five. We'll see how that thing goes. Move here to our number four. Ruben, what's your number four? My number four is a card that's near and dear to my heart because I love cards that draw cards. And more than that, I love creatures that draw cards when you play more creatures. I play an Arcades the Strategist Commander deck. I love Inspiring Commander on Magic Arena. Mm -hmm. I love Mentor of the Meek. And I love Welcoming Vampire. Two generic and a white for a 2-3 vampire with flying. Whenever one or more other creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. That's very powerful Spicy. ladies and gentlemen that is going to refill your hand in the white aggressive decks that is going it's a two three flyer for three right mm -hmm. can jolly sunwing stats like we've got uh riel the the what's uh what's that card called ray dane that's the card Redane, yeah uh two three flyer is good like that it's gonna get in some chip damage it's gonna combat well in constructed format like in that mid game area and get a little bit of value later on as well. Yeah, this card seems just prime with value. It's good, evasive. It has three toughness, which is fantastic. Again, one of those $9, $15 for the super cool Fang treatment uh -huh. version, which is awesome. Um, you know, it only triggers once a turn, but sometimes that's okay. Make a token during your turn and their turn. Right. Draw two cards just like that. Yeah. Gather the townsfolk on my turn, raise the alarm on your turn. Mm -hmm. Like we can, we can do things. Yeah, that's a lot of card. Um, I'm a little sad to see, uh, I, I agree, this does seem pretty sweet, and it's already going to be in the white deck that's already pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't make me super excited. Um, you know, same, same for the, like, the uh, you know, the Thalia that we think is Epiphany fodder or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, sure. yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more excited about the other colors, but this is definitely good. You know, I there was something that Wizards, um, one of the Wizards dev guys had said a year or two ago, um, which was something to the, to the effect of, you know, it, we understand that there's going to be certain decks and certain archetypes. You know, what they want to do is to give you enough choices and enough variations that there isn't just like, this is the best mono white aggro deck, right? They shouldn't just be, this is the best. It should be, well, here's a version of mono white aggro. Here's a different version with vampires. There's a different version with bigger creatures or with, with angels or, or whatever it is. But you are able to have, you know, not just this is the de facto best thing. Slide welcoming vampires of four of them here and you're done. It's like, no, let's let's think about how this deck works now that this is a really cool three drop instead of uh, the PBDDR's card. Right. Example. So, all right, Nerd Girl, what's your number four? Uh, my number four is a type of card that I've always kind of enjoyed uh, that is sort of the top end for red, and then that is the Mana Form Hellkite. Mm. This is a four mana, two colorless red, red for a four, four flying dragon. And then uh, whenever you cast a non creature spell, create an XX red dragon illusion. Uh, creature token with flying and haste where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell. Uh, and then you uh, exile it at the end of your next end step. Uh, now this says mana spent, so it's going to make things like Deluge become 
uh, nutty and there's like, you know, obviously epiphany and things like that. So it's got some really cool implications there. I don't know if it's going to replace gold span dragon, but it's definitely more aggressive. And I think if the deck for whatever reason doesn't need gold span dragon, that this is going to be a pretty sweet thing that'll be able to close out games really quickly. Like if you can manage to play this, hold open a counter spell to protect it, untap epiphany, holy smokes, your opponent is dead. Yeah, this this has a like sort of a lot of explosive. This is one of those cards. I'm like, damn, that extended art foil is seventy eight dollars. Like, there is love around this card that I was not really expecting. I thought it was it was okay. It was good. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in the red blue, essentially the red blue epiphany decks, you can think about right. there ways you can trigger it. And you get a two two here, and the Prismari command gives you a three three, and it's kind of cool, sort of almost chip damage style. Um, but I'm guessing you know people want to play big big spells with this to get giant monster creatures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the four mana dragon from the last set that is also absurd? Um, you know, you can play those two together. Yeah. Uh, the, the, it, like, whenever you cast a spell, you can discard everything and then uh, draw Moonvale cards. Region. That's the one. Yep. So you can have these, I mean, these four, four mythic flying dragons for four are insane, yeah, right? Like, you can spells. build an entire deck that is nothing but really actually great dragons and just like burn spells um and with epiphany of course this is insane with deluge this is insane and people are already playing those cards so it slots right into that strategy i'm ready for my sorkin historic deck to to get some let's go the plus yeah. one make a shivan dragon in your hand all right let's go maniform hellkai why not that card's awesome all right, so for my number four, uh, this is, I'm guessing it's a higher on Nerd Girls list. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, I'm a little surprised it's not on Ruben's list, but that's okay, because there's a lot of good cards, as we've kind of noted here, in the set, I've been really impressed, again, as we talked about in the pre-show, which is, you know, I thought I was not really happy with the set, but the more I looked at it, the more I liked it, and the more I found a lot of cards that I could really, really like, and it's easy, it's super easy. To like my number four, which is one of the sort of the face cards of the set, which is Soren the Mirthless. Mm -hmm. Soren the Mirthless is two black and two generic mana for a four loyalty legendary Soren, Planeswalker, of course. For plus one, you look at the top card of your library. You look at it and you may reveal it. You ain't gotta. If you don't want it, it's okay. But if, if you do, you lose life equal to its mana value and you put it in your hand. So you can reveal it and put it in your hand to lose life or you can't. You don't leave it there if you want to. That's amazing. For minus two, you make a, a two, three black vampire creature token with flying and lifelink. And for minus seven, it deals 13 damage to any target and you gain 13 life. The first two abilities are just so bananas. If the third one ever happens, whatever. I'm happy making like, you know, my vampire nine hawks essentially with no death touch and mm -hmm. or just dark confidence forever. Yep. Yeah. This is your number uh, six, you said? Nerd yep, Nerd? this was my number six. Um, nice. I think that this is great. Um, it's super, uh, you know, synergy with a lot of the what the set wants to do. Uh, I, I don't... As far as limited goes, it's the type of Planeswalker I like to see. It's not overly powerful to where like, if I am in the lead and you play this, then I just, okay, well, I give up. So, but it is going to win you the game if you're ahead or at, you know, you know, even board state. So that is fine with me. And I, I do think that this is going to be a really nifty thing that might give vampires, um, a little bit of a fighting chance, at least in some of the lower ranks. And also I think this is going to be great for casual play. This is something that a lot of vampire decks are going to want to, uh, to put into their EDH deck, casual formats. Yeah. I think this is going to be super fun for people of all types of, uh, of gameplay. Something that I really appreciate appreciate about this Soren is, you know, recently we've seen a lot of planeswalkers that are good in context or good in specific circumstances or cool. good in tribal synergies or, you know, they require some you they require you to build around them. Soren asks nothing of you and it just is good. Um, I I really appreciate that about this card, and it's also iconic. Like it's a classic Planeswalker design. Each of the abilities are like, yeah, that's a, a classic callback to another black card, right? Yeah. This feels like an original Lorwyn Five Planeswalker. I this you could put this next to the original Lorwyn Five, and I'd be like, yeah, I don't know which one is the archetypal Planeswalker, you know. And I really appreciate that about this card's design. 
Yeah, I mean, and they also have this the the Ayami Kojima version uh, mm. with with the Fang uh, art treatment. <laughs> that thing, that foil is one hundred and seventy three dollars right now. So, <laughs> yep. good shocked. luck, Godspeed. Trying even if you don't get it in foil, it's fifty five dollars. Like that card, it's it's got Simon Belmont on it. All right, everybody, yeah. and that's super cool. And I know it's it's not, but it is. It is. Yeah. It's not, but it is. Wizards can't ever say that, but we know. You know, I know. That's Simon Belmont, and that's awesome. For Let's move on here to our number three. Ruben, what's number three? Well, we just talked about a Planeswalker, so now let's talk about my favorite Planeswalker from the set, Chandra, Dressed to Kill. Chandra, Dressed to Kill is a generic red-red for a Chandra legendary Planeswalker with loyalty three. Plus one, add a red mana. Chandra, Dressed to Kill deals one damage to up to one target player or Planeswalker. Also, plus one, exile the top card of your library. If it's red, you may cast it this turn. And minus seven, exile the top five cards of your library. You may cast red spells from among them this turn. You get an emblem with, whenever you cast a red spell, this emblem deals X damage to any target, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell. This has two plus one abilities. Like, I don't know if you've... I don't... I'm not sure there's a Planeswalker that has two plus one abilities that's not good. Um, you know, the first one that came to my mind was Elspeth Knight Errant, where mm-hmm. it just sort of just has value. That it was the OG. Needed. That was the OG. Yeah. That's right. And it just always does good stuff. Um, the minus, the ultimate is whatever, but we're going to get to the ultimate a lot more often because we've got two ways to get there. Much less the fact that this costs three mana. It ramps you into your fives like Goldspan Dragon and Burn Down the House mm-hmm. and it's card advantage. I mean, yeah, it does some of those things. If it doesn't die, it doesn't protect itself. It doesn't do a lot. I think, I mean, this is, I, I would rather have an uncommon and limited than this most of the time. And then in, for, in Constructed, I just don't think that the red has what it takes to make this viable. I'm. This is not a card hmm. I'm personally excited about, but it's a pretty sweet art card. I do love the flavor of it. I well for what it's worth, I think you're wrong on the constructed part. I think in limited, I agree with you. In some ways, you'd have to be very heavy red um, or have some really awesome five and six drops to really kind of make this worth it. But the other half of it is is that people are afraid of planeswalkers, and I think part of it could be like just having her on the field will gain you you know five sure. to six life just because they'll come at her no matter what happens. Yeah, um, people are just afraid of that stuff. But in constructed, in a world in historic, when I can turn one land or elves off a stomping ground and turn two let's get started on this girl i mean that can get going really fast i agree it does not properly kind of protect itself you will need to untap with it but three mana two plus ones i'm on board maybe it's bad but we're definitely going to find out no no to be fair i was mostly talking about standard um in my evaluation of what this is going to do to the standard format yeah in in historic like i think anything's possible (laughs) i just kind of uh write that one off Mm-hmm. I mean, that format is kind of, it's a lot. That format's a turn four format. So on turn four, you better be doing something really stupid, like collect a company or better, or you're just wasting your time most of the time. I tend to let three mana Planeswalkers slide on the protecting itself uh, abilities. Typically getting down a turn earlier than everything that's like haymakers Mm -hmm. i i tend to accept that um much less the fact that this is able to uh, uh, fight against other planeswalkers pretty good um you know in a format that has a you know if we see a format that has a bunch of like renin sevens for example i think chandra actually matches up pretty well against those decks um right i think that this is a it's a clock that helps you dig through your deck to look for your other answers i i, I agree that red has a problem in standard right now and this is definitely a it's obviously a card that wants red spells so if red gets good, then this will be very, very, very good. And I think that this is a thing that can help it get there. Okay. As yeah. the guy who plays Historic, Lana Royals and Gilded Goose as my 8-1 drops, and this into a sick 5-drop, like, let's go. Like, I we mean, can get there. That card the plus, is dope. The second plus 1 gets worse the more Lana War Elves and Gilded Geese we have in our decks. But, but maybe that's our only mono green stuff. You never sure. know. I guess we'll see. Uh, that said, Nerd Girl, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is a card that we talked about a little bit in the uh, last week's pre-show. I'm a big fan of this card. Again, I think this is something that might 
not quite make it into uh, in constructed play and standard just because it is a very jammed up sp- of curve spot and that is the cemetery prowler this Mm. is a three mana colorless green green for a three four wolf creature it has vigilance when it enters the battlefield or attacks exile a card from a graveyard and then spells you cast cost one less for each card type they share with exiled cards of cemetery prowler um now this is this specific prowler we talked about this a little bit before um so if you do another one it won't still have that so it's a little bit different than robber of the rich which i was a little sad about and i think that might be a breaking point as to why this doesn't quite make it but i have a soft spot for green uh for mono green decks and i i like shuffling them up a bunch so i'm excited for this card I mean, there are things that we have available that trigger off cards leaving the graveyard, which I think is interesting. Um, This, again, choosing cards in your graveyard to make your stuff cheaper so you can use spells to mill yourself, uh, milling your opponent to try to get sort of an angle on that. But again, just on rate as a three mana, three, four vigilance is generally pretty sweet. Uh, And getting that ability to trigger every time it attacks and not just getting the one or the enter the battlefield or dies like the black version uh, is way more interesting and way more powerful in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, 3-4 Vigilance on turn 3 with no cards in graveyards, I'm just taking that. Like, I'm just Fine. accepting that. Um, much less if there's something to snag out of a graveyard. Also, I don't need the cost reduction. I'm, like, happy to just get rid of the first thing that they've discarded, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm happy to just snag their Faithless Looting, I mean, or whatever it is in Standard, you know, their their Shambling Ghast that they sacrificed. Um, and... I, I I think that it is going to uh, be super relevant that when they play their four mana wrath, when your opponent plays their four mana wrath and you go to your fifth turn, you can go three mana cemetery reaper, exile one of the creatures that died, play another cemetery uh, wolf. Uh, so that's yeah. pretty darn good. Yeah, this card is super dope. It's price to move, I think is the way that I would put it. Yeah. Well, for my number three, look, we're going for the extended art $60 foil versions of stuff because I like big, scary things. I like giant monster idiot creatures. I like big, scary, giant monster idiot creatures that go for 32 bucks up to the $60 we were talking about a minute ago. Because if you're going to go and you're going to go hard and you're going to crush faces, you play Cultivator Colossus and you smash from the top rope and you don't care because it's three green, four generic mana for a star, star, mythic, plant, beast, woof. It has trample. It has power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. But the big kicker and the breaker, honestly, is that when it enters the battlefield, you may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield tapped if you do draw a card and repeat this process. So not only is it cool and fun in a land-based deck, is it sweet in a deck with abundance because that card is broken with this card. It's just a giant idiot who just kills things, and I love that. And I'll take giant idiots to kill things. Yeah, This is definitely the Sarah Avatar of green. Mm. This is like... The biggest possible monster that you can cobble together. The fact that it also has an infinite combo that says get every land in your deck into play and stack your library is cool. Like, that's a cool thing that you can try to cobble together. Um, The fact that it is going to be, you know, a 30-30... You know, you know, it's going to be some absurd number, much less if you have um, a spell or a, a, a permanent that turns all of your uh, permanents into forests. Oh my God, there's a, a couple of them like that. Shia, yeah. Life and Limb is another one. Yeah. Like, there's a bunch of ways to be able to be like, oh, by the way, this thing is actually a hundred power. Um, and I, I think oh that God. it's it's really important to have these big giant green things do things that when you read them, you go, what the hell. Like, what <laughs> in the world is happening? And we've got those, right? We've got Nyx Bloom Ancient. We've got Ashaya. Uh, we've got, you know, there's a bunch of these big giant uh, 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 gate gate warden, the one that lets your lands trigger twice. Landfall trigger twice. Um, yeah. Landfall trigger t- twice. Um, the, the, that spot is really important. And I feel like this fills it uh, amicably. Nice. Yeah, and this is definitely a fun and interesting card. I don't think it's going to be standard playable, but I do think it's going to be pretty fun in other formats where you can do things like cheat them into play or ramp 
uh, absurdly into them with other things that are, you know, now rotated. But it's a definitely an interesting card. I'm going to play it in limited and be excited. Yeah, I mean, this is the card, like, if you're playing green, blue, ramp, and you're playing ramp, 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 it's cool. Honestly, the only word this card is missing is haste. If sure. this card had haste, yeah. it would just be stratospherically stupid. Honestly, one thing that this thing has going for it, other than those big giant green idiots that I had previously mentioned, is this thing does something when you play it, right? Mm. This thing doesn't just get doombladed. This right. thing might draw a bunch of cards. It's got regal force mana. It right. might just regal force you and just draw 10 cards by accident. If you're playing that mana ramp deck and you've got 30 lands in your deck, you're going to draw a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. Now you get to put a bunch of them into play, and that's pretty dope. Yeah, this card is super sweet, and I think it's fun, and we'll see how it goes. Let's go in here to our number two. Nerd Girl, what's your number two? So my number two is a card that I think is going to help out a current existing deck, and uh, again, it just works really well with with what's near and dear to my heart, and that's Ascendant Pack Leader. Uh, it is a 2-1 for a green. It's a wolf, and an Ascendant Pack Leader enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it if you control a permanent with mana value four or greater. And whenever you cast a spell with mana value four or greater, you put another plus one, plus one on Ascendant Pack Leader. So this is a really early, aggressive green creature that's going to get better with time and become this massive beater and uh, we've seen something similar there was a one one every time you play something with higher power it gets a one one and uh, and that thing snowballed and made green very good and was part of like basically the best opening hand for it and i can see this doing something very similar and it's going to be great with things like a, a seeker's chariot because it does say spell it doesn't say creature so it's going to be triggering off of so many things and i think that that's pretty fun yeah this card's amazing um, this card is, this card is Pelt Collector. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the fact that this thing can fight alongside stuff like Essica's Chariot and Renin 7, um, that deck has trouble bridging the gap, right? It, mm -hmm. it the, the problem with midrange right now is that it can't keep up with white and it gets smashed over the top by those Epiphany decks. This card does both things it helps it race the epiphany decks and it also puts it in like a three two on turn two a lot of the time um or not on turn two but like it's a it's a two one that gets there very quickly like this thing grows up very fast um it trades early and it's only one mana you're not getting you're not losing a lot if this gets taken out and um yeah i think that this is exactly the kind of card that you actually want well, this is exactly the card. Like, if you could just, you know, just say, hey, you're playing the Red Green Werewolf deck right now in Standard. What do you really want? You'd say, can I have a sick one-drop wolf, please? Yeah. That's awesome early and late. Because this and the yeah. Naturalist and the Tovalar is serious business yeah. and will be part of your Standard format. Honestly, my biggest complaint about this card is, why wasn't it in the Werewolf set? Like, why wasn't it in the Wolf set? Why I, is it in the I Vampire don't... set? I don't know, man. It's like what, there, there weren't that many werewolves in the werewolf set, which always kind of freaked me out. But yeah, this is this is the Savannah lines that the werewolf deck needs. They were asking for it. They were looking for it. And it's not just against that one counter. It keeps getting counters the more you play these big spells like that. Again, mm -hmm. it just helps out over the long game. It helps when you play your Arlens and put counters on this thing. Like It just it scales fantastically. This is a terrific card. Absolutely. Uh, Ruben, much number two. Um. I just talked about how, for some reason, werewolves weren't good in the werewolf set. Fortunately, vampires are very good in the vampire set. Mm -hmm. I have four, three on my list, but like three and a half. I've I've got some were some werewolf adjacent cards, right? Like Blood mm -hmm. Fountain. I feel like they made they made vampires very good uh, in this set. So so I, I'm very pleased by that. And the fact that they made the Big Daddy Vampire very good in this set makes me very happy. My number two is Count Dracula himself, Edgar the Charmed Groom. <laughs> Edgar Charmed Groom is too generic bl uh, white black for a legendary creature vampire noble, 4-4 four, four for 4. Uh, other vampires you control get plus 1, plus 1. 
And when Edgar Charmed Groom dies, return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control, and it transforms into Edgar Markov's coffin, which is a legendary artifact that says, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 white and black vampire creature token with lifelink and put a bloodline counter on Edgar Markov's coffin. Then, if there are three or more bloodline counters on it, remove those counters and transform it back into Edgar Charmed Groom, which is super dope. Um, it can't die in traditional means, which it's a vampire lord. It shouldn't. The fact that it is like the black white vampire lord uh, that turns into the the coffin from the Dracula story and then comes back three days later uh, is is spectacular storytelling, really evocative card design. And, oh, by the way, extremely powerful for, hopefully, a resurgence of tribal strategies in Standard. This was... Sorry, I have my my top, my, my uh, email on my phone. So this was my mm. number eight, my higher. Uh, one nice. of the things I wanted to talk about when you're looking at cards from a limited perspective when it comes to this is how impactful is this on the board if they have the answer? Now, this isn't terribly like they could just remove it and then boom, your Lord is gone, you know, you're doing the thing, but this comes back. So it's not something that they can like answer easily. It needs to be exiled and there isn't a lot of access to that in the format. So this is going to be something that is going to be leaving a lasting impression because it needs to be answered more and more, which is just an insane card advantage. You're basically getting that, you know, their premium removal out of their hand every couple of turns. And it gives you tokens that help with the uh, extort, which Black has a ton of, and it's just all over the place. This is a great card I'm excited about. Yeah, this card is absolutely terrific. This was my number five. I think, like, looking at it now, $15, 20 bucks for the Fang version. The Dracula the Voyager version isn't even being pre-sold at this point because God knows what it's going to be worth. But it mm-hmm. does have a Dracula version, which is cool. Dracula the Voyager turning into Casket of Native Earth, which looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this card is just super cool. And, like, regardless of those who were like, why can't it be, like, red, white, black? It's like, well, it's also cool to have a white, black vampire that's cool and neat. It's a vampire. Vampire Lord is exciting. It's sweet. If I want to play a vampire deck, I want to check this out. I want to build a brawl deck. I'm going to start right here with Edgar, which looks super duper fun. I love the fact that when you when you turn it over, look, I lived in a world. I grew up in a magic design land that would say something like you needed those three tokens to live. And like the three tokens it makes in order for it to flip back. Like it, it couldn't just put counters on itself and flip over no matter what happens to those creatures. No, those creatures needed to be on the battlefield in order for you to flip him back. Obviously, we don't live in that world, thankfully, because it's not as fun. It's way more fun to be like, yeah, you got rid of those life linkers or whatever, but hey, here he comes and then he comes back. And if you don't deal with him, you just made three, two, two life linkers, which is also fantastic. So I will take it coming and going. This card is great. Just think of like the ability to sacrifice to your own spell and things to flip him into his coffin like that's the thing it's not just your opponent that's going to be answering this guy you can turn him into card advantage if you need to and that's fantastic just terrific card i love it you know they pacifism in it or whatever for some reason just do something else with it yeah. and it'll come back later uh for my number two this is a card that it's not any of your all's list and that's fine i i know why because this is my number two because as we have been discussing uh i spend some of my time in historic and when you spend time in powerful formats and formats that are sort of impacted by various cards or abilities when you see a card that fits directly into that card slash ability thing that you see all the damn time you understand that when they make a new one you're going to see it all the damn time i'm going to be looking at and playing against and seeing across the battlefield so many voice of the blessed you just don't know how the life gain deck is an historic it's everywhere and they love to play it all the time for two white it is a 2-2 two, two rare spirit cleric. Whenever you gain life, you put a plus one plus one counter on it. And as long as it has four or more plus one plus one counters on it, it has flying and vigilance. So when it's a 6-6, six, six, it has a it's a flying vigilance 6-6. Six, six. And as long as it has 10 or more plus one plus one counters on it, it has indestructible. It's not hard to gain 10 life when your soul wardens are firing off like crazy in a historic format. This thing is going to be absolutely bananas on casual tables everywhere who love this stuff and historic players who just can't stop with the life gain deck. <laughs> yeah. They just won't. 
I mean, this is a better a Johnny's Pride mate, and a oh. Johnny's Pride mate sees a lot of play. Like, yep. I mean, it, this is the shoeiest of shoe ins for a consistent card. Not only is it a better a Johnny's Pride mate, it is just another a Johnny's Pride. Like that deck would play eight and probably oh, yeah. will. Now that it has access to this. Oh, by the way, this one has two white pips, right? So it actually ter- turns Heliod on more. Well, um, <laughs> the thing is, they have, there is another Ajani's Pride Mate on Arena. It's one of those Arena only starter yeah. cards. It's a two mana one one Ajani's Pride Mate. This is just what replaces it as the best thing ever in that mm-hmm. two slot. Nice. Just crazy. Yeah. Thanks, great. Yeah. All right. Let's move on here to our number one. Nerd Girl, what's your number one? So my number one is a card that I think everybody's very excited about. I think that they think that this is the answer to Epiphany, and that is the Thalia Guardian of Thraben, or mm-hmm. as I like to call her, the uh, Warden of the North, it looks like. Uh, mm. And she is two mana, yeah. colorless, and a white for a 2-1 with first strike. Uh, non-creature spells cost one more to cast, which is exactly what the mono white wants to be doing. They want to be pooping out a bunch of dudes and then attacking you with your land once you clear the board and finish the job. But this is going to put you, you know, one land off of, or I'm sorry, one uh, mana off of your counters, your bounce spells. Uh, everything is going to be more difficult, which will give just that extra one or two attacks for uh, you know any one particular creature to get in for the the lethal before your opponent can epiphany off. This is also really relevant against the mono green matchup, which does fare a little bit better because Chariot and Renin 7 and all of that are going to come down much slower, allowing white to continue to get under uh, under the bar there. Yeah. yeah, you have the ability to do Paladin class into Thalia, and if you're on the play, you just disrupted their Ranger class. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, Thalia dominated Standard, Modern, and Legacy already. Uh, so it's going to uh, once more. Um, Thalia's spectacular. It is the hate beariest of all hate bears. It is going to make, probably make Mono White better than the Epiphany decks. Um, I'm not sure that it is going to shake up what the top tier decks are made of any more than anything else, but uh, Thalia certainly is going to make its presence known uh, in Standard. Yeah, Thalia is the kind of card that, like, again, as you mentioned, it it usually just gives you one more turn. And a lot of the times, that's all the white aggro deck needs is that one more turn. Just let me yeah. play and pump my Paladin class. Let me activate Paladin class level three. Just give me that one turn where you don't wrath or you don't kill it, or you had to kill it using four mana instead of three, so you couldn't play two spells in a turn. Yada, yada. Like all those little type of things. That's why this card is so powerful and exciting. Not because it's going to win you the game on, on its own, but because it gives you that little edge that you'll see when you play with it to go, yep, you know, if Thalia wasn't there... There's no way I'll be able to play X, Y, or Z on the curve. So, yeah, card is Tay Rivik. Ruben, what's your number one? My number one is a card that, you know, I was looking through the spoilers and I was like, what is going to, what is actually going to make the most impact? What is something that is going to slot into a deck that doesn't all, re- that, like, that is already good and is going to make an immediate impact? And I think that this is a card that fills a need in the Is It Dragons, Is It Epiphany deck. Oh, they needed something. <laughs> I mean, they needed a lot, but one of the things they needed was like a early-ish, mid-game-ish card. They needed something to just go under the tires of a Luminarch Ascension, right? They needed to get something that could find you know, their, their Alrin's Epiphanies and their mid-game cards and also provide potentially a clock that would put a little pressure on other people and do something. This card does all of the things that that deck wants. My number one card for the set is Wandering Mind. Hmm. Wandering Mind is a generic, a blue and a red for a 2-1 horror creature with flying. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a non-creature, non-land from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. That's um, that's so many cards, first of all. Like, looking at six cards is 
astronomical, much less the fact that we get a wind drake out of it where we can put pressure on, on planeswalkers. We get a little bit of ticky tack damage in here and there. And it just replaces itself. And I think that this is actually the, the card in this set that slots into something that exists already the easiest. Hmm. One of the things I think that this will do, so uh, the the thing that I think that this will compete with in that deck is actually Deluge. Not that Deluge is bad, but when you cast Deluge, you're looking for one specific thing and you're like, I'll also pick this up, uh, whatever that might be. But this is actually a way to dig deeper in your deck, get that card that you really need, and provide a nice little blocker against the mono white deck um, to just get through more of your deck. You still get the thing that you need. You don't get the second thing. We're probably not cutting Deluge, of course. But oftentimes, the reason we're losing to these mono white decks is because we just don't have a chump blocker to get one more you know, turn closer to our, um, our board clears or to our epiphanies. Yeah, this is like the greatest wind drake of all time. I mean, we've seen great wind, great wind drakes, you know, two ones and like a one one from where the spark and all this other stuff. But, you know, this is definitely up there in terms of whenever you can, you can tell this, it's, it's a good barometer on magic cards, right? When Siphon Insight gets the top two exiled, okay, it's fine. Top two is whatever. Top three, mm-hmm. interesting. Obviously, you're in brainstorm worlds or whatever. Top four, okay. Top five, whatever. Top six is a lot of cards. Like, That's- that's Collected Company, that's Winota. Like, I know that that's, those are on a whole nother power level scale. That's 10% of your deck, and it's more than 10% because you've already drawn cards off your deck. So, like, that's a lot. That's a whole bunch. So, and it's also find. not just, it's not just instant and sorceries. Right, you can get, you know, artifacts, like anything. Yeah. That's fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. That card is is very, very exciting. Um, for my number one here, it was tough for me to choose exactly. I was, and again, this is, you know, I was legitimately impressed the more I looked at the set because I was like, wow, I like this. Wow, I like that. Oh, this is really cool. Oh, that's really cool. For my number one, I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to praise a few things. One, to acknowledge there's a cliche involved. And, and wizards, you need to be fully aware of what's happening. And they've subreddits have already made fun of this. But uh, we have become, we have started to become a cliche that whenever we go to Innistrad, 13, 13, 13, 13. Hey, look at how everything's 13. That's a 13. Hey, guys, there's a 13. Hey, those two numbers add up to 13. Hey, 13, y'all. So when you lean on 13 these days, it's it, it gets to be a little cute a little cliche in some ways but this was one of the leans that i hadn't seen before you know i've been around a long time seen a lot of magic cards up down left right center okay i've seen a lot of wrath of gods i've seen a lot of destroy all creatures i've seen a lot of sacrifice all creatures i've seen a lot of pay life minus x minus x creatures but never have i ever seen such an interesting wrath of god on the fact on the back of buy invitation only for two white and three generic mana, it's a rare sorcery that says choose a number between zero and 13. Each player sacrifices that many creatures. It's cheeky with a 13, but holy, have you ever seen anything so perfect for the type of decks that a white player would want to play? Like, I mean, for the entire time I played white weedy, white aggro, white go wide, whatever the hell you want to call it, this is the card I want. They would play the Scarab God or whatever, and I just couldn't get through it and I would die. Like, they would play two awesome things that had life link and I couldn't get through them and I would die. I would have eight creatures, but I just need to get through two. And this is perfect for that. And I love of that and i think this is brilliant yeah i think right now the format is a bit tall um and this is going to be really really nice to have uh have access to and i think that this is going to find a home in in lots of different formats I 100% agree with everything you said. I actually didn't put it on my list because I would have put it at my number one because I love it so much, but I knew you would have it at your number one because (laughs) it's this is a perfect magic card. It's beautiful. This is a perfect magic card. It's costed right. It has the right effect. The 13 is actually well done here. The name is perfect. Yeah. And it's very good, but it's not broken. It's going to do exactly what you want. It's going to make them sacrifice their one tree folk and their two wolves. It's going to make them sacrifice their one gold span dragon and their two bird tokens. And it's going to leave around your little idiots, which is unbelievable. It's so good to be able to play a wrath in an aggro deck. 
That's amazing. And it's also a wrath for control decks, too. Yeah. Like, they'll just choose a higher number. Right. Right? So, and it gets indestructible things. Like, the thing, the, the gets amount of- proof like- <laughs> Just absolutely spectacular. Um, gets around regeneration. Like, the list goes on and on about how perfect this card is. Yeah, this card is sweet. And again, even the limited environment, like I'll just choose 13. It's fine. I'll, just, I'll yeah. kill everything and we'll move on. Or I'll just strategically, we have a strategic wrath. That in, of itself is amazing. Yeah. All right. And that was our top 10 Crimson Val cards. You'll see them on screen right now if you review. Take a look at my list, Ruben's list, and Nerd Girl's top 10. It's like, I lose my script here. Uh, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win 50 bucks worth of anything at CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Nerd Girl. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you for coming to the wedding. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Ah, ah, ah. We did it. All right. As we go to our final slide, I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsors, CardHoarder.com and Altersleeves.com, my co-hosts, MTG Nerd Girl and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching and listening and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.